Hildy is a body chain smoking 70 something former journalist who lives on the Upper West Side in an apartment that has a portal back to 1973. Time travel has rules, though, and Hildy breaks them by traveling back with healthcare aide Trista. Now both women will have to come to terms with their pasts before they lose their chance at having a future. From Ahoy Comics comes Elisa Quitney's Guilt, that's G-I-L-T, a comic book that's Sex in the City meets the Golden Girls by way of the Twilight Zone. Call your local comic book store and ask them to order your copy of Guilt today. Welcome to Endless, a Sandman podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm writer and decayed raven woman, Alisa Quitney. And I'm story expert and purveyor of Penny Dreadfuls, Lonnie Diane Rich. Today on Endless, we're going to be talking about Sandman Volume 1, Preludes and Nocturnes, Issues 2 and 3, Imperfect Hosts, and Dream a Little Dream of Me. Both issues were written by Neil Gaiman and illustrated by Sam Keith and Mike Dringenberg. It is never only a dream, John Constantine. Time to wake up. All right, so Elisa, here we are in our second episode of Endless, talking about issues two and three in Preludes and Nocturnes. What did you think about these issues overall? I loved these issues. These were the issues that absolutely made me fall in love with the Sandman. The first Mm -hmm. issue in particular, well, I mean, the second issue, but the first that we're talking about, I think of it as a phyllo pastry of world building. And just as in a phyllo pastry, you're not aware of how much butter there is. There Mm -hmm. is so much world building and so many little references to either old comics or uh, world mythologies, but you don't, you don't notice it. It's not like, look at me, look at me. It's, it's just buttery, so light that you you don't realize how many calories you've just consumed. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but calories in storytelling, though, is actually good. Yes, it's the, the good <laughs> the good calories that nourish the story and make you feel like you you could just eat this all day and there will be more, yeah. more deliciousness. <laughs> the um, the other thing that I love so much about uh, the, the first issue, the second issue, mm-hmm. the first we're talking about tonight. Sorry, I keep about doing imperfect this. hosts, imperfect hosts. That's all right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Are the hosts. I no. grew up as a kid loving Cain and Abel, who were the hosts of the House of Mystery for Cain and mm-hmm. the House of Secrets for Abel. And so this was when I saw those characters, it was I, I, it, somebody touched my soul and tickled it. It was just <laughs> so incredibly delicious for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the other thing that I really love is that I could see right away that this wasn't just all the feels I had as a kid. This was a mm-hmm. darker, deeper, more nuanced take on these characters. Yeah, which is really fun and super horror. Like it's it's really, you know, you were talking to me because, of course, I haven't read all of it yet, you know. Um, and one of the first things that we talked about is kind of this tonal shift that apparently is going to happen where we start out in this like deep horror space, you know, and then we move into um, into something, you know, like a little less like that, a little more fantasy, I guess, um, a little deeper mythology and less on the blood and the walls covered in the human living remains of a person like that kind of thing that we get to. Um, but the horror elements in these issues, um, it's, it's really, really thick. It's really good. And for somebody who doesn't like horror, I actually still enjoy it. Like I can, this is a horror that I can get behind. And I think because the fantasy and the mythology and the world building are, is so deep in here. I think that's a big part of it. The other part of it is it's not one note horror. There is Mm -hmm. humor, there is campiness, there is tenderness and even like flat out adorable cuteness. There, there Mm -hmm. just is a wide range. It's, you know, there's these days, a lot of people talk about dramedy, that, that fusion of drama and comedy. This is a Hardramedy, or I har. I we need the word for I don't know it. If we have a portmanteau a for that. Hardy. Yeah. <laughs> a horror romance. 
Yes. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of that in there. Um, I mean, you know, I loved both of these issues for different reasons. Um, Imperfect Hosts, I think, did a ton of that world building. Um, it's a kind of a pause in the story a little bit while we got to know some characters. And usually, honestly, I prefer for my narrative to keep moving. But when we have so much going on here, like I think that you can make an argument for slowing down, for breathing a little bit, dream needed to just lie down for a while. <laughs> you know, and was able to do that with them. Um, and uh, and we were finally like mostly in Dreams POV for, for this first one for Imperfect Host, which I thought was really good. Um, and then, of course, we shift into Dream a Little Dream of Me, which is Morpheus on a mission. But again, told through a different POV, told through John Constantine, through his eyes, who will forever be for me like Spike from Buffy. I just I cannot see him as I understand that Sting apparently was the inspiration for like the modeling of the physical modeling of the character um but he he reads to me so much like spike and already i'm madly in love with john constantine oh, so i'm really really looking forward to spending more time with him do not do not that is one of the main differences <laughs> between the classic john so i say john constantine because that's what the brits called him although i think oh in is the, it supposed to be constantine well it, okay. i thought it was and then all of a sudden there were all these tv and movies and they started to call him constantine but in my head He's Constantine. So okay. I, I'll tell you this. I I think the cool thing about the Constantine I know from from Neil, from Jamie Delano, from Garth Ennis mm -hmm. and, and other wonderful writers is he's just really an asshole. He's an incredible <laughs> bastard. And unlike Spike, where I, I had my uh -huh. cat that I just had to put down at 19 years, he was called oh, I'm so sorry. Spike. I, I have oh. the biggest crush uh, on Spike. Uh -huh. don't have a crush on John Constantine. He is like the hero of a dark romance and you think there's going to be that turn and <laughs> there will not be a turn. This is, he <laughs> gets all his friends killed. This is the thing oh my you goodness. need to know about John Constantine. Yes. Mm -hmm. He is, you will, there, there's a, I think this was a Jamie Delano story where he's lying next yeah. to um, a sex worker and he says, I just, I just want to be held. I just want someone to listen to me. And he tells her about all these awful, horrible things. And then he turns over, he sees she's fallen asleep, exhausted. And then he shakes her and says, change me mind. Oh my God. <laughs> Wait, that was more, more Irish. It was meant to be Cockney. I'm not so good with accents. But anyway, that's, that's, okay. yeah. that's John Constantine. He's um, okay. And so he's got lovely, he's, he shows some vulnerability in mm -hmm. this issue and i think it is because he is a foil for for dream here but when you see him mm -hmm. in other iterations and when you see him he is again he is on the byronic scale of mad bad and dangerous to know he is he you will end up with your you know relatives becoming nightmare wallpaper oh no <laughs> Well, it's another man set out to break my heart. I mean, what am I going to do? Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get into our summaries. In Imperfect Hosts, we enter a spooky old house and meet two brothers, the malevolent domineering Cain and his quivering anxious brother Abel. A knock on the door reveals a damp and bedraggled Sandman brought in unceremoniously by the cheerful dog-like gargoyle Gregory. Back in the waking world, 90-year-old Ethel D. visits her son at the Arkham Asylum for the Criminally Insane. Ethel D. was revealed to us as Ethel Cripps in the previous issue, where we learned that she stole Morpheus's dreamstone, Ruby, from Ruthven Sykes. Now, we learn that her son John, a handsome fellow in his youth, is in bad, bad shape. D has become a golemask, emaciated, mad husk of a man, dripping with more fluids than a Bernie Wrightson monster or Rudy Giuliani during a press conference. Oh, and we also learn that John D is known as Dr. Destiny. Dr. D is also a character some readers may recognize from DC books before 1985. In The Dreaming, we learn some important geography, Gates of Horn and Ivory, Lucien's Library, and staffing issues, The Raven Woman, Brute and Glob, The Fashion Thing. The Sandman shows us his powers by raiding dreams to collect the ingredients to summon the three witches slash fates slash furies and ask them to help him locate his stuff. But was this a good idea? The witches think not. Still, the scavenger hunt plot is on. Also, Abel opens his birthday present, dies, and comes back in a moment that is both poignant and chilling. 
It's only blood, little brother. Only blood. In Dream a Little Dream of Me, we meet up with John Constantine, the last known possessor of Dream's pouch of sand. Dream finds Constantine and wants to know where it went, and the two search Constantine's old storage unit, and he's reminded of his ex-girlfriend Rachel, who was obsessed with the pouch, and who stole a lot of Constantine's stuff while he was away. Dream and Constantine travel to Rachel's house, where they find her doped up on the sand, constantly dreaming, her father's human remains covering the walls, yet still alive. Dream takes his pouch back and lets Rachel dream a happy dream as she finally dies. As they part ways, Constantine asks Dream to do something about the nightmares he's been having since the Newcastle incident, and Dream obliges. All right, Elisa. So there's so much happening in these stories. Um, but one of the things that I really like that stood out to me right away um, in the Cain and Abel story, An Imperfect Host, is that we open up with Cain and Abel talking about, again, Morpheus, Dream, a million names, Prince of Dreams, but they call him the Prince of Stories, and they identify themselves as being from the first story. Um, and the thing that I love about this idea of dreams as stories is that stories are meaning delivery systems, you know? Um, and so identifying not just as dreams, which feel somewhat ephemeral and maybe not as meaningful, but I, but identifying them, equating them, basically, you know, making these um, synonyms, right? Uh, dreams and stories gives the dream world and the dreaming so much more power. Um, I love that Cain self identifies as a storyteller. He says, That's me, your worship, purveyor of penny dreadfuls, shilling shockers, blood and thunders, and first rate nightmares. Um, and I thought that was so so cool. It's it's incredibly cool. And what we will see at the end of the second issue is how Ka how Abel, sorry, uses mm -hmm. storytelling in a very personal way because mm -hmm. his his story is the first tragedy. And yeah. his story in the Sandman is a recurring tragedy since he's mm -hmm. going to be killed by a brother who hates and loves him and whom he fears and loves, and it's going to happen mm -hmm. over and over. And you get the delusion of the story that he tells himself and Goldie the Gargoyle. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's there's something very emotional about how it, it's not just cerebral and not just a tour de force of stories, mythology, you nuggets of this. There's, yeah. there's heart in this, and I think that's mm -hmm. really important. Well, yeah, I mean, it is... Because the thing is, in abusive relationships, like abusive relationships are not devoid of of love. I mean, it's a corrupted love, but it's but the, there is love there, you know, and that's, I think, what makes it so incredibly destructive and watching Abel's experience of abuse is is I mean, it's. It's so good and it's horrifying and it's, you know, like visceral, you know, literally visceral as Abel's viscera is splattered all over the place. Um, you know, it, and, and the thing in the experience of abuse is that is that you never know what's coming. You know, is it love or is it a, is it a punch? Like you just never know, you know, and and his experience of that where he's afraid to open the present, you know, and then he opens the present and the present is nice, but he says the wrong thing in wanting to name it. Right. And then that's why Cain kills him. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really evocative of the abuse experience and um, in, in some ways a little difficult to read because it is so. It is so dead on in that. No pun intended. Yeah, it is. I think that mm -hmm. one of the great balancing acts that, that Neil does here is that he still manages to convey the sense of Cain and Abel as these campy horror hosts for, for mm -hmm. children, which is what they were yeah. when I guess Neil and I were reading them as kids. And yet mm -hmm. also to give this this more nuanced shading fun aside about yeah. Cain and Abel. So <laughs> uh, back in the day, there were a lot of horror anthologies. So they were, these were mm -hmm. stories, short stories. Um, EC is the originator, I believe, uh, of, of some really wonderfully drippy, disgusting horror. And then there were lots mm -hmm. 
of DC did them. I can't remember if Marvel, Charlton, Red Circle, there were a lot of different horror titles. And they mm -hmm. tended to have hosts that would sort of frame these things together and they would reprint older stories. Uh, so I guess I think it was Joe Orlando at the time uh, mm -hmm. felt that that DC in the 70s also needed to have, no, late 60s, sorry, horror hosts. And mm -hmm. so he modeled Cain and Abel, not just after the biblical Cain and Abel, but after... Yeah. Uh, Len Wein was a writer who, along with Marv Wolfman, wrote a lot of tons of early DC comic stuff. So um, Len Wein had a particular look and always wore a, a brown corduroy jacket. And uh, and so Kane was very much modeled on his look. And Joe uh -huh. also had an assistant. Uh, I think his name was Mark Hannerfeld. Um, I had to mm -hmm. refresh my memory and then my memory <laughs> immediately begins to slip. And I guess he was the physical model for Abel. So what you get is instead of just having these campy or, or ancient yeah. characters, you get the sense that there, there were real actors in there embodying them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where that comes from. Oh, my God. How cool is that? And what a way to be memorialized. Yeah. I mean, awesome. Creepy, but awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we also do like some of the, the dreamland world building here. Um, the Gates of Horn and Ivory, I am fascinated by. We get the slightest hint of, of what these actually mean. Um, on page 64 in the Kindle version, um, we have dreams saying, I carved them myself when the world was younger and order was needed. The dreams that pass through the Gates of Ivory are lies, figments, and deceptions. The other admits the truth truth and no one guards the horned gate anymore i don't know what that means but i love it um i feel like there's so much world and we talk about that like phyllo pastry kind of feeling here we are in i don't know 20 30 words or whatever like there's this whole bit of world building done in that and then we just drop it you know, he's just describing it and we're going to get to that later, you know, um, but that to me is is so neat. And the only thing like I don't want to do spoilers here. We will do spoilers later in the Lucian's library section. Um, but I do want to ask like a vague question. Is that that truth and lies going to feed into the world building of this dreamland space um, more like what they mean by that? I Are we going to see more of that? I don't recall it as being a major element, but it's it's yeah. part of the whole mythic geography there. And um, yeah, yeah, I I always kind of love the idea that the 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 gate that is the gate of truth is like the Canada border crossing, and that it just doesn't get as much traffic <laughs> as, get as much some of the traffic. other borders. Right, right. That the dreams tell the truth. The ones that lie. It's just it's it's fascinating to me because it seems to me like in the dreams, that's where the truth happens, even though it's it's told in fiction, it's told in metaphor, you know, so it's all of it lies because none of it's literal. It's all metaphorical, but that there should be more truth in dreams than necessarily there is. Um, to me, that was such a fascinating idea. And I hovered over that for a really long time, just thinking, oh, my God, I cannot wait until I find out more about the Gates of Horn and Ivory. I love that. I yes, I love that. There's the I think there was the the shifting lands there. Mm -hmm. There's definitely these nods to the geography of the place. Um, also, there you get the three witches and yeah. this is so I, I think I, I was mentioning this is staffing issues, but no, the three witches aren't <laughs> staff. They are they are their own right. ancient entities. So mm -hmm. uh, the three witches were also horror hosts of yeah. uh, the witching hour. It, yeah, it was mm -hmm. called the witching hour. And uh, I loved them because the, the youngest of the witches, Cynthia, was this very mod witch. And she was mm -hmm. always a little, you know, come on to her. Mm -hmm. You know, she never said that the other were her mother and grandmother, but it, mm -hmm. it was implied and she wanted them to be more with it. And when she told her stories, they were always more involving teenagers and rock and roll as opposed to classic horror. <laughs> And all of a sudden, they come on here and they are, for the first time, really de deliberately, explicitly linked with all of these triads of female power from mythology, the fates, the furies, mm -hmm. the norns. Yeah. Oh, my God. No, it's yeah. so. The, the Well, I mean, of course, the three, 
you know, the split identity into into three is a classic, you know, thing. And the fact that that we've pulled them all in, you know, he's pulled them in. Uh, Lucian calls them Earth, Ver- Vertandi and Scald, which are the Norn mm-hmm. names. Dream calls them Clotho, Lachesis and Atropos. And I am butchering the Greek on that one. Uh, the Hecate, the Fury, the Graces. Uh, of course, they map to Terry Pratchett's weird sisters, Magrat, Og and Weatherwax. Um, and here they name themselves Cynthia, Mildred and Mordred. And I love that moment where she's like, Mordred is stupid. It was supposed to be Morgane. <laughs> and, yeah. and so the reason it's Mordred is that is what it was in the 70s. Uh, yeah, that was right. the name that she was given. Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, yeah, although Mordred is a cool name. I just feel like if I personally, I, cool I would love to be called Mordred. I think Mordred is awesome. Um, it's really neat because we do have a lot of threes kind of reflected here. You know, we've got the, he has to chase the three things. Uh, his ruby is Halma's pouch. He's got three answers coming from the three graces. So we've got all of that kind of resonating, you know, um, throughout this story. Um, but Dream also, like I was talking about before, like he has a number of names. Um, he's Morpheus. He's Prince of Stories. He's Prince of Dreams. He's just Dream, all of these things, right? All of his um, conceptual siblings all have names that start, I believe, with D, you know. Um, and then, of course, we have John D, who is also Dr. Destiny, who has another shifting identity. Um, so we have all these different identities kind of writhing around in the same space. And I mean, you know, if I was advising a writer on giving one of their characters more than one name, I would be like, ah, you know, it's going to be confusing. But there is something in, and again, like this is one of the things, this is the reason why there, there aren't rules in storytelling, there are principles and you can follow the principles, but if you can break them with flair and still have your story work, then do it, you know, and Gaiman does this all the time and with such incredible skill that I'm like, who cares, right? You know, I mean, it's just a principle. It's just one of those things that can make it easier for a reader to connect with characters. But here, having these characters have so many different names and have so much shifting identity um, between all of them. You know, they've all got these shifting names, these shifting identities, these these kind of magical shapes. They're almost all um, sort of shapeshifters, if not in literal shape, then in in the way that they appear, you know. Um, and I absolutely love that that feeling of magic that comes from that shifting identity. And we have it in these in these mythological you know, in Dream and in the Three Furies and all of that. But to also have it um, in John D, to have some shifting there too. We also have shifting with Ethel, right? Ethel was Crips when she, you know, ran off with Ruthven Sykes and took all the stuff and then became D, I guess, when she when she left to, to cover her tracks or whatever. Um, and also really interesting that she became Ethel D. D is the letter for dream and desire and death and all of these siblings. Um, I just find it fascinating. And I think that it really works. Yeah. And I there are also characters that are named only briefly here and they're going to factor in more. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lucien man- uh, mentions the Raven Woman, the decayed mm-hmm. Raven Woman, and we're going to find out more about her. She is Eve, mm-hmm. and uh, so as Eve was another horror host, as was Lucien. Yes, and mm-hmm. Eve appeared a lot in a short-lived comic called Plop. Uh, mm-hmm. Plop. So she- Eve would appear with Cain and Abel, drawn by this incredible cartoony artist called Sergio Aragones. And so mm-hmm. he would do these tiny little, I'm making gestures that no one can see because <laughs> this is a, a, a tiny little mm-hmm. doodly characters. And by the way, Sergio Aragones is still going strong. I think he's 120 or maybe Mad Hedy's oh. age, but he's still <laughs> completely productive and, and, and wow. prolific. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. anyway, so I loved him. I loved those characters. And this is an aside. So as when I came on staff, I did a spinoff with the Three Witches with the writer James mm-hmm. Robinson, and I did a, a reprint issue of Welcome Back to the House of Mystery, where I got Neil to do a new framing sequence, and I got Sergio Aragones oh. to to draw some of these characters. But sorry, this is a complete digression. Oh, no, I love it. I love all this behind the scenes. I love that you actually worked on this stuff. It's so cool. Well, but the very cool thing for me (laughs) is the Raven woman, she's going to come back. She's going to figure in more. Mad Hetty will. Mm -hmm. Nothing is just dropped in at random. And one of the things I remember Neil saying to me 
was mm-hmm. that the more intelligent you assume your reader is, then the more intelligent the reader will assume you, the writer, are. And, oh, my goodness. And I said, that's brilliant. What do yes. you mean? And he said, <laughs> don't, don't connect the dots. Let the mm-hmm. reader connect the dots. And I think a lot of times when... As a writer, I I have this urge to be explicit and to say, I've dropped this breadcrumb and there's another one over there and let me let me have some character connect it for you. Mm -hmm. But Neil is really going to let you connect these things later on. He's going to let you discover stuff. And again, this mm-hmm. was all done before Google and the internet. And uh, oh, sure, mm-hmm. one, one cool, funny Neil thing. Neil was publishing his scripts on CompuServe, which was one of those early, early <laughs> internet. I remember servers. CompuServe. We yes. thought. I thought he was nuts. I was like, if you publish your scripts, who's going to buy the comic? This is terrible. <laughs> you're giving it. You're giving it away. It's like <laughs> sleeping with. You know what people used to think when you slept with someone before marriage? Why will they marry you now? For you have given them your virtue. <laughs> giving them the script. <laughs> Everything about the cow and the milk is insulting to everybody involved, I have to say. Um, but I love this, I, you know, and I absolutely 100% agree um, with Neil is that like you, you don't talk down to your audience. You always talk to your audience like they're smart, you know, because they are because they're way smarter. My audience is always smarter than me. That has always been the case, you know, um, but I absolutely love this quote. And I am going to be quoting Neil um, all the time from now on, because that is brilliant. Um, I, I love that the more intelligent you assume the reader is, the more intelligent the reader assumes you are. And I mean, that's true. Also, I think that one of the things too, that as a writer that you really need to build with your audience is trust, right? And if you don't trust your audience, they're not going to trust you. So it's this intelligence thing, but it's also this, this transfer of, I'm going to take you on a ride. You're just going to have to trust me, you know? And then when the reader knows that you trust them to be involved and to be active in their reading, then they're going to trust you to take them on a ride. And I think that maybe like one of the many things that makes Neil such a, and I say magical writer, not in the sense that he writes about magical things, but that he really does have this ability to connect with his readers on this very like, personal in this very personal space you know like you feel like you're with him on something not necessarily that he's leading you through something but that you're just with him while this is happening you know it's very very cool I love the way he does that um we move from imperfect hosts into dream a little dream of me um which is where we get when i say visceral horror that is exactly what i mean the dad's guts are all over the walls of the house. Um, you know, it is it is just such a, um, a really horrific kind of scenario. And yet told through the humanity of Rachel, you know, who was an addict and who, you know, wanted to get into this pouch of sand and somehow figured out how to do it and then destroyed herself in that pursuit. Um, and, you know, and we see at the end, you know, in this in this horrific circumstance where we found this house that is is living is it is her father's living body that they're walking into, which is just a horrific thing. And it's not um, just yeah. I just want to say, I think it's not just his body because you can also see these little demon demonic dream creatures. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so they have been feeding parasitically off of his body. And yeah, you can't see it people who are listening, but my hand is making little like sneaky parasitic, you know, twin like, yeah. hey, we, you know, we, we <laughs> hunger, we hunger. <laughs> and, um, and that is, I uh, just, mm-hmm. I love that it, it's creepy. It's kind of almost cute in a mm-hmm. really creepy, creepy way. And that yeah. all of my favorite horror films like Troll and Leprechaun had gross mm-hmm. little things back when also before CGI, when yeah. puppets when were, were made for effects. everything. Yes. <laughs> and I just I, I I'm really hoping that when they do this scene, I, I mm-hmm. in the TV series, I just want some of that vibe of like somebody made puppets for months. Some of that Henson this. Henson-esque vibe. Yes. yes. <laughs> Everybody out there who knows how I feel about Muppets will uh will understand why that's Wait, have funny. You, have you anyway, ever <laughs> seen Troll? Yeah. The, the, uh, no. Okay, I so I just Troll. this is a, mm-hmm. a brief little. So I a Troll was 
it was troll, right? It was it was this this apartment building where all the apartments get turned into weird fairy kingdoms, and there's a lot of mm-hmm. this kind of strange horror. I that mm-hmm. is how I see it, and I just need to say that everyone should okay. watch Troll. But anyway, I okay, okay, well, well I will watch Troll. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it does have that whole like creepy and there are those demons and they go in and then they find her. So in the midst of all of this that feels, um, other than human, you know, that feels so, so creepy and horrific, we have these really tender, we have this tender loving moment. Constantine finds her there, you know, um, as dream is leaving, Dream is just like, she's done, you know, she's going to die and that's it, you know. Um, And Constantine is like, you can't just leave her there, you know. And then Dream goes back and gives her this one last wonderful dream so that when she dies, she's not in pain and she's not suffering. Um, She's just passing on, you know. Um, And there's something about that at the at the end of this story that is in many ways so inhuman, you know, that we bring in that element of humanity and of love and care um, that makes it makes the inhumanity and the horror of it all that much more powerful because of that touch of humanity in the middle of all of that. Absolutely. And it it's interesting to me how well Constantine works as a foil here, because mm-hmm. in other he is a real trickster character. Uh, mm-hmm. Spike, Spike in Buffy usually gets fooled in some ways. He's got this facade of toughness, and underneath mm-hmm. it, he is truly a romantic character. Whereas yeah. Constantine, he does have pangs of conscience, but he's a trickster, and he will he will you know screw you up and screw you over. Mm-hmm. And um, and here, although we do see him feel guilt, feel regret feel fear and so his humanity here is what allows us to see mm-hmm. that he he is something other than than what you, you know the dream is not a human character whatever his tenderness is it's it's much less accessible than even constantine's yeah. um yeah. i should mention here that constantine um, is a character who was created uh by alan moore and and various artists it was was it rick veach uh, mm-hmm. Steve Bissett and John Tottlebin, and he was created in uh, the pages of Swamp Thing, and mm-hmm. I, I think it's sort of interesting because before Neil Gaiman, Alan Moore took a DC horror book and mm-hmm. really transformed it by making it more literary, more political, more mythological, and and using some of the horror hosts. So a lot of the the stuff that we are responding to here was initiated or that that there you know alan moore did did a version of that in in mm-hmm. swamp thing which is also an incredible book um his constantine is much more of a trickster he appears there mm-hmm. and you've got swamp thing who is sort of noble and doesn't quite understand humans and john keeps uh appearing and sort of taking advantage and manipulating and so you see him as a really manipulative character so i think a lot of people yeah. came already having some experience of constantine from that mm-hmm. yeah oh my god it's so cool like the way that we're pulling in all of this stuff from the previous world building and kind of finding a space for that within these stories which of course is one of the classic things that you know like the dc universe and the the marvel cinematic universe or the marvel comics universe as well that they they always borrow from each other they're this this cast of players that sort of circle around each other and, and find ways to exist in each other's universes which is why i think that the the narrative you universe of something so expansive as like the DC universe or the Marvel universe, there is so much and so many different kinds of stories happening within that same place. Um, And that's uh, what has drawn me into them is that they're so incredibly expansive that there are really no limits. You can 
do all pretty much anything, you know, at some point or another. Um, it's very, very cool. Um, one of the things that I really appreciated in uh, these issues um, was Dream's experience of his trauma. You know, um, before the imprisonment, he says he would have just been able to go home. He wouldn't have had to travel through all of these dreams. He wouldn't have had to lower himself the way that he had. Um, but his trauma means that he can't just go like he has to stop and he has to heal first. Um, and I can feel that trauma narrative within this story. Like trauma changes us. It changes how we function. It changes how our brains work. It changes how we experience the world. Um, and he spent his e last bit of effort on trying to get back home, back to himself, and he can't. And he ends up, you know, in this house with these dudes, you know, um, and then he he has to get a piece of himself from them. So you, you see that like he is when he was strong, he scattered pieces of himself far and wide. And now he has to get them all back just to get the strength to return home. And um, and that to me as a trauma narrative, I think is a really interesting um, kind of flavor to this Cain and Abel story. Mm, yeah, it it's interesting because I. I also see him, he's, he's been traumatized, but I also see him because he is so stoic and a little bit unknowable. I mm -hmm. see him as very motivated by duty, by doing things the proper way. He has a task, he has dream, he has mm -hmm. to be dream, he needs to, he's got a function to perform. In that sense, he's a very British anthropomorphized concept of dream. It's not like he's yes. some hippie, louche, bohemian, mm -hmm. you know, saying what you feel, baby. He's, you know, he's he's got a he's job got to do. He's got business. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. stars that shine in his eyes when Constantine asks for a favor hint at his power and the power of his potential displeasure for me oh, mm -hmm. but the little smile he gives when he does do rachel that kindness gives us a glimpse that he's a more nuanced character that there are aspects to him that are not quite as forbidding just wanting yeah. power because his his he wants power not for power's sake but he needs to regain his power to perform his function he is very, yeah. he's like, I, I sort of see him as one of the royals, one of the royals with a very uh -huh. well-developed sense of duty and, and the mm -hmm. sense that it would be unseemly to have an yes. emotion. <laughs> to have an emotion. That is really interesting. Like, I hadn't really like caught that that moment of of sparkle when uh, Constantine asks for the favor you know um but it is interesting because it does speak to his power and it also like you know again and I think that one of the things one of the things I talked about a lot in uh, listen up a-holes which was the Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast that I did was that these these stories of these these comic heroes tend to be identity stories and at the core of dreams identity like who he is, is that he is dream. This is like, and you know, and you have those moments too, like, who am I if I don't do this anymore? Who am I if this isn't what I do? That we are so aligned, our sense of identity is so aligned to the roles that we play, you know, like I am a mother, I am a daughter, I am a wife, I am, a, you know, all of these things like that when we identify, I am a writer, I am a podcaster, you know, like all of these things, it is about what we do and the roles that we that's our sense of identity. And without that role to play, your identity sort of crumbles. And so here we have dream with his identity crumbling, you know, he gradually gets enough strength back you know, when he gets those uh, letters of commission from Cain and Abel, that he can move on the next step and that he can hunt down the stuff. He can, you know, summon the three witches and very slowly is getting his power back. And so I love that. I hadn't really thought about it, but that, you know, it is a moment of humanity that he gives this to Rachel, but it is also like the first, the demands that were made of him, those are not yours to receive, nor are they mine to give. He didn't have the power to to grant Burgess either Roderick or Alex what they what they demanded of him and here somebody asks for something and he has the power to do it and so he does it and that adds an interesting nuance to the motivations behind that moment of humanity you know did he do it because it was the human thing to do and the kind thing to do or did he do it because he had the power to do it it's 
It's true. I'm also having this thought that is not a fully mm-hmm. fledged thought, but I'm wondering <laughs> if through the course of the series, if when we see Sandman be cruel or be kind, it's very often with women. Um, Interesting. And I'm, I'm, that is the, that is the thought that I'm having, that there is a, a romantic element to that mm-hmm. with him. Uh, so I don't know. It, it probably just goes back to both Dream and Constantine being really bad boyfriend material. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's going to be an interesting line to follow as we have our, you know, very Byronic romantic hero. You know, I mean, that's kind of and when you think about romance in the sense of, you know, the the bombast of it, you know, the the hyperbole of it as uh, of the experience as opposed to necessarily like the the, you know, lowercase r romance of the love story and all that kind of stuff. But like the big r romance, that sense of, of you know, just uh, everything being so heightened and so intense um that's that's really interesting to see how 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 they are as as byronic romantic heroes um one of the things that i have to pull out though like there are so many lines in these that i just absolutely love one of my favorite ones and this is a this is kind of a throwaway line but i absolutely love it for its specificity which by the way the the most powerful tool in the writer's toolbox is specificity uh The air is musty, tired, old. It smells of lost dreams and rotten fabric. Um, If anything paints a picture of Cain and Abel's abode, there you go. I mean, that is just beautiful. I love that. It's true. And I I feel I have been in that room. Uh (laughs) (laughs) We've all been in that room. (laughs) Yeah, there are wonderful. It's also very visual language, but it also conjures smell, which is very yeah. Dickensian. I think that mm-hmm. there are, you know, we all definitely are aware of Neil Gaiman's links with Shakespeare because Shakespeare mm-hmm. is going to be a character in The Sandman. We're going to see explicitly a lot of this um, someone who is retelling stories where the plots and some of the characters come from other sources. But I think there's a lot of Dickens being brought mm-hmm. to work here. And the yeah. whole idea of a huge cast of characters, of uh, an awareness of class and society and, and different roles, and this it, it bringing uh, the sense of smell and memory in is a very Dickensian mm-hmm. um gambit i don't know that's probably not the right word but it's i just want to say it's it's like eight o'clock as we're doing this and i get stupider with every passing hour you are never stupid the day is long and full of terrors (laughs) (laughs) and at the end we get tired all right so lisa what are your favorite lines here well one of my favorite lines is where he's uh dream is on his scavenger hunt and mm-hmm. he's pulling elements from other dreamers' dreams to you to create the summoning spell. And he says, the gallows comes from a young Japanese movie buff, her head roiling from a surfeit of old Hammer horror films. <laughs> so a couple of things here just yeah. really jump out at me. We were talking about awareness of how you are casting characters in your mm-hmm. book. And we don't see this this dreamer. But we know she's Japanese. Well, we I don't know. Actually, from this, I'm not sure. I'm assuming that she is Japanese and not just a movie buff of Japanese movies. Of Japanese movies, Because yeah. the movies that we're talking about are these old Hammer horror films, which are wonderfully mm-hmm. campy horror films. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, and it's just having this dreamer be a girl who mm-hmm. loves horror films yeah. and having her be, I'm reading this as that she is Japanese, yeah. feels wonderful to me and it's just so specific that he pulls the gallows from that Mm -hmm. and there's it's almost a mini story in a line yeah no it is i mean and that's one of the things that again like for the writers out there specificity when you can pull something like that you know it, it ends up bringing with it um, so much. And again, we've talked about, about the phyllo pastry and about this, this being kind of like a, a nutritively nutrient dense kind of storytelling, you know, in comics. Um, and, and those kinds of details bring along all of these other associations with them and, and wielded well 
you yeah. know, so that all of those associations work together. Um, that can be really, really beautiful. And again, bring in all of these levels of, of what's happening in this storytelling in this one little, little tiny panel on a page full of other stuff, you know, because he's gathering all sorts of, uh, of stuff for of uh, items calling and... in the fates. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's one other thing where in the three witches, yes. they're going through all of these mythic <laughs> names of Atropos and uh, like, yeah. the Jesus. I don't know. I always sound very Jewish when I start trying to say Greek names. Um, yes. But, uh, and then Cynthia ends with, you might as well call us, what is it, Diana, Mary, and Florence, um, <laughs> yeah. which is the Supremes, right? Uh, I think so. Yes. And I just, I really love mm -hmm. that. It's just a ridiculous moment. And, mm -hmm. um, and it, it brings b the characters back to their campy 70s selves. So yeah. again, I love this blend of flavors. I horror that dares to be funny sometimes, like um Ed, what's his name? Edgar Wright as a director. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Grady mm -hmm. Hendrix mm -hmm. as a writer. Mm -hmm. It's just a flavor I particularly enjoy. Well, it's really fun because the thing is, is that just because you're telling a horror story doesn't mean that you can't have other elements in there, you know, and, and the combination of, of these things. And I like, you know, like a fusion of genres, you know, when you have things that sort of mix together that way. And while this is funny, there are funny things that are happening within this and we can clearly see the sense of humor coming through. It never breaks the horror. You know, it's not like the movies like Scream or any of those where it's like the horror is there and then we have the humor and it all of it kind of escalates into an ultimate ridiculousness, which is appropriate. That's what the film is trying to do. You know, so I'm not I'm not like, you know, like, you know, bashing Scream or anything. I'm saying it, it sets out to do a thing and it does exactly that. But the the effect of that kind of almost sitcom -y humor along with all of that, uh, that horror, it makes a different mix. This never gets to the point where the humor takes us out of this. And as funny as it is, we're talking about all these immortals. It's, it's still a very human story. Dream isn't human, you know, and his his responses to things are not. But but like this, you might as well call us Mary or Diana, Mary and Florence. That is a very human line coming from these three witches, you know, these magical, mythical, you know, um, beings. Um, and I love that that mix that even though we do have horror and we do have comedy, it is all really great grounded it is all very deeply grounded i think that part of the thing is, is that the you know these things these stories these these archetypes have been carried through human storytelling for so long because they do speak to to something within our psychology that is extremely human that is extremely grounded and by pulling in all of this metaphor and all of this mythology um, this story itself remains deeply, deeply grounded, but like dream, you know, it is metaphor. We're talking a lot in metaphor and that's what makes it so rich and so interesting. Um, so moving on into our Lucian's library, for those of you who are averse to spoilers, this is your warning that we're going to be in a spoilery space, possibly, uh, as we talk about things behind the scenes and we talk about, uh, things that are kind of outside of the stories themselves. So just a minor warning about that as we move in. Um, and one of the things we want to talk about a little bit was we had talked a little bit about uh, dialogue and dialect uh, last time. And, um, and so you had some more thoughts on that. What were your thoughts? Well, first of all, here we've got John Constantine, who mm -hmm. is speaking a little bit. I can't remember if it's a Cockney or a South London accent that he started out having. Mm -hmm. I know in the films, he, when he was Keanu Reeves, obviously he had a Keanu Reeves accent. And exactly. he was, uh, what was the other guy? Matt, um, Matt, he's got, I think, a Liverpudlian accent. Uh, I'm mm. trying to remember which actor know. that was. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I was, well, first of all, I had a little bit of a back and forth with Neil and he was saying that for him, comics is a very, ver you know, it, it's auditory. Mm -hmm. He hears yeah. it. And I was thinking to myself, well, yeah, it's true because, you don't have all of the tools in your toolkit that you have as a prose writer. So mm -hmm. for example, as a prose writer, I could have someone say, you know, she spoke with a soft Jamaican lilt and then just mm -hmm. do the rest of that character's speech uh, with just a, a hint to the rhythms rather than the spelling of the, yes. the mm -hmm. character. You don't have that in comics and you also have this weird thing you do 
Kind of like mm-hmm. old Cosmo magazine always had italics for emphasis. You bold certain words for yeah. emphasis. Mm-hmm. And they're not partially it's it's where the the the, the beat of the voice falls, but it's, mm-hmm. it's it's sort of a weird gray area, I think, between mm-hmm. a visual and a verbal emphasis. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking about that as I looked at John Constantine's dialogue and Mad Hetty's, uh, which is yeah. uh, very dialecty. And mm-hmm. uh, if you notice, I can't remember the line she says, but she uses some insult that is definitely Victorian, which goes <laughs> along with her age, which is right. 247. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I don't know. I just wanted to mention that. You know, that you don't have all those tools and you also don't have as much so that if one character, if Rogue says, well, sugar, you know, it's one thing. (laughs) And if I'd written an entire novel first person in complete Mississippi dialect, I think that would have been quite another thing. It's a bit much. I mean, yeah, like anything, there's always a spectrum on these things. Um, I, I generally think that Constantine and Hetty are actually excellent examples because Constantine, for the most part, is written in actual words. Like you, they're written, they're spelled the right way, you know. Um, but they are used like the the choice, the word choice, um, the way in which he phrases his thoughts and ideas and everything. You can hear the accent coming out in that. The reason why I am against writing phonetically in dialogue dialect we'll see with Mad Hetty, right? Because Mad Hetty, you're looking at that. And even though, yes, I mean, I think that Neil has a good point. It's a visual medium. You don't have the opportunity to be like she said in her, you know, her Victorian accent or whatever, um, that, uh, that it becomes something that is difficult to read. And what that does is that puts as a reader, when you're trying to sound everything out and figure out what it means um, for Mad Hetty, um, it puts a distance between us and that character. Like I found that character harder to connect with than I think I would have if the exact same word choices had been there, but they'd been spelled properly. Um, so that I could, and some of them were spelled like there was one, the, the, the number seven was spelled S E V V I N, um, in the dialogue. And part of me appreciated that. Because part of me is thinking, here she is, she's old, English has changed. When she was around and learning all of this, maybe that was how she spelled seven, you know, because that was the opportunity that came to her, right? And so we're seeing it so deeply in her POV, which I think is actually kind of an interesting argument against what I'm saying. But in the end, I think that it it creates a distance. It, it keeps your your character a little further away, a little held at remove from your reader. And I think it makes it a little bit harder to access that uh, that character. That said, you know, it's a lot of argument about something that essentially comes down to a choice. But I would just say for the most part, I think that and and definitely like, you know, as I think I mentioned in the last one, the, the Diana Gabaldon uh, um, novels for Outlander, as I read those, um, I found that whenever we got deeply into the Scottish dialect and she was using a lot of that phonetic spelling that most of the time I couldn't even understand what in the world anybody was saying. And you want to make sure like clarity is your first job you know, as a writer to make sure that again, like, you know, it's not like you want to spoon feed everything and be, you know, but at the same time, like, I think Constantine came along a lot clearer and even his accent and everything came along without using that dialect. That's my argument. Anybody who wants to take that can take it or leave it with whatever they want. I just, I think that it is um, almost always better to err on the side of of clarity and and keeping the character close to your reader so that your reader can understand them that's it that's my whole argument i i think i mean all of those things are true i have a feeling that mad hetty's accent is a lot mm-hmm. thicker than constantine's yeah. and i mm-hmm. and i think you know there's some of that you know probably just Seven, I, I don't know, it's probably <laughs> lingering on the V. But um, I yeah. now want to write an entire first person Mad Hetty novel. That's no one will ever let me do it. But I, I just, <laughs> you know, she got up to some interesting business. Well, I, we, I'm looking forward to seeing more of her. I think she's a fascinating character just in the one page that we had of her in these. Yes. And I remember back in the 90s when mm-hmm. whenever, you know, Neil would reveal something, I think, oh, look, he made up some cool new word for this crazy magic thing he's doing. And then I, I realized, oh, that's a thing. 
that's a thing. <laughs> so I, um, yeah. So we will we we will find out about all of those. That's going to um, be fun. Things. So I I just um this is. I'm trying to remember why I wanted everyone to know this, but I, I was remembering <laughs> this is yes. just stupid John Constantine stuff. I thought about mm-hmm. Constantine a lot. Oh, God, I never no, edited yeah. Hellblazer, but he he was uh, mm-hmm. so back in the day, there were these huge billboards in England for silk cut mm-hmm. cigarettes. And they were yeah. really subtle. There was a giant like fabric of silk with a big cut in it that looked kind of <laughs> like a genital uh, mm-hmm. opening. And uh, they were, as I recall, and so I'm sure somebody's going to write and say, you're wrong. But I remember them as being the Virginia Slims of English cigarettes. And Ooh. it was established that that's what Constantine smokes. Oh, uh- <laughs> So I love it. I, I, yeah, it's. I, I feel I'm. I'm getting old enough so that when I remember some random fact about a character, <laughs> I feel deeply obliged to share it with everyone no, before it do. goes away. Please do share it, and this is exactly what Lucienne's library is for. <laughs> so, um, yes, I remember. The other thing was that uh, Constantine. It was originally thought that he dyed his hair as I think Sting did at some point Uh and then under certain comics uh, I think at one point he was in a very bad way was he in hell he was in hell many times and Mm -hmm. he wasn't showing roots so I guess that changed the canon of whether or not he was a dyed blonde oh interesting uh, I wonder I wonder if he's not something of an inspiration for the character of Spike and Buffy because I just see a connection between these two but anyway as I understand I'm not supposed to fall in love with Constantine so I'm gonna let that go (laughs) don't do it Lonnie we've all been (laughs) there that way lies pain you you, you always you know you always fall in love with Constantine thinking that he's Spike and Mm -hmm. that therein lies the rub well, falling in love with Spike is a, a problem as well. I'll uh, take it. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we have some interesting uh, information about the covers with Dave McKean. What do you have uh on that so i feel because of the format of all of this we're talking about the artists we're talking yeah. about neil but we're not talking about dave and dave was such an integral part of this comic and of this process Mm -hmm. so he Mm -hmm. did these amazing covers and one of the things that set this book apart Mm -hmm. were the covers which i think went every time i want to say something definitively i can hear a voice saying but is it true i think it's true (laughs) i you know so i believe these covers Uh moved further away from that you know representational Batman, there's Batman on the cover, yes. Wonder Woman, Wonder, mm-hmm. you know, Sandman Salmon's on the cover. And you have get mm-hmm. these covers instead that combine real fine art of, you know, gorgeous drawings, but mixed with photography, mixed with found mm-hmm. objects, mixed with sculpture and collage and, and all of these different elements. And um, it, so Dave and Neil were both I think they both approached Karen together they approached Mm -hmm. her as a team and initially you know you can look at artwork right away and be wowed writing takes a little longer to parse so I think Karen's initial reaction was wow look at this amazing artwork Mm -hmm. and Neil's first uh work for Karen for DC was a a miniseries called Black Orchid Mm -hmm. and Black Orchid was another obscure character and and uh, I think she was spun off from Swamp Thing and she mm-hmm. was given her own book. And so Dave did the interior art on that. Dave's gone on to just, you know, be an amazing, uh, he's he's had like an incredible career. Uh, uh-huh. But at the time, you know, he was doing these covers. And uh, and I remember that because it was hard to tell exactly what was going on, we, we had Curtis King was the, the in charge of the covers. He was the editor. Uh-huh. I forgot his exact title, but he would come along and talk about the covers. And I remember him always calling us out for having nipples. There were nipples. <laughs> there were things they would look for the elements. <laughs> and it was hard to always spot if there was a nipple in a Dave McKean cover because it would be, yeah. you know, embedded <laughs> in some weird, you know, helm or something. Was he was he trying to get the nipples past you? Is that was that a game? or <laughs> I, I I Dave was yeah. beyond such consideration so Dave was a very yeah. serious you know he he came across as like a very serious artist he has uh-huh. an, a great sense of humor but it's very subtle 
Mm-hmm. And he came and I didn't realize that a lot of people were intimidated by him. And mm-hmm. he came, he and his partner, Claire, I can't remember if they married then or they've been together mm-hmm. since um, fetalhood, I think, in art yes. school. And mm-hmm. they, they remain friends of mine. But at the time, I think I was a very immature 25 or 26. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I love your art. Could you draw something on my leg? <laughs> I just, I don't know why. It's the most embarrassing. Did he do it? He spent about, I think, an hour drawing this incredibly. <laughs> oh, my God. And I just, I looked at it. I said, I, if I got tattoos, I would, I would get this made into a tattoo but I don't so I, I won't but I won't wash uh-huh. for a very long time oh and my God. Um, anyway so he's an incredible artist I I think that uh, maybe I I'm not organized enough because the the book I've got I don't have the covers all in front of me I think what I'd like to do is before we do uh, next uh, our, our next one I'm going to prepare and talk about each of the covers oh can I go oh, backwards good. and do that and I'll go and yes. talk about the elements we can see in each of the covers uh, oh, because wonderful. I think it's otherwise yeah. we're kind of missing out on that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I'd love that. Cool. Um, all right. So one more thing that I wanted to talk about quickly as we start to wrap this up um, is John Dee's parent, parentage. Um, we see an imperfect host that John Dee's mother is Ethel, Roderick Burgess's girlfriend who ran off with Ruth Van Sykes. And it is not specified in the comics whether John Dee is Ethel's son with Roderick Burgess, Ruth Van Sykes, or someone else. Um, but in the audio version, and again, I haven't listened to this yet because I'm reading the comics now. I'll do the audio version later. Um, um, from what I have read on the various internets, uh, it says that Roderick Burgess is his father, making him Alex's half brother, and then even more deeply tied into this line of antagonism with Dream, which I find really, really interesting. I don't know if that is, I mean, my guess is that's canon. Is that canon? I think so. This is one mm-hmm. of those moments where uh, Joshua Unruh would have the answer at the tip of his, at the tip <laughs> of his, uh, and I'm sort of like, ah, I didn't know. I feel like this about my own relatives. Like, oh, we were related through that person. I, I, yes, I, I, I do know. <laughs> I think it's really interesting, though. I think it's an interesting idea that that maybe he is and maybe he isn't. Possibly we might be able to get Neil to answer that for us for once and for all. But I guess my guess is that if it's in the audio version, um, the, that must be something that is actually part of that canon. But I am not entirely sure. All right. So as we're wrapping all of this up, Lisa, between these two issues, Imperfect Hosts and Dream a Little Dream of Me, uh, what is your favorite page? This is a hard one because I yeah. I love the pages with the three witches. I they're they're I love gloopy, disgusting body <laughs> horror. It's just always a big. Uh, anyone who knows yeah. me knows that I'm all there for body horror. Mm-hmm. But I think in the end, I love seeing the way Abel's murder is amplified through Goldie, the baby gargoyles, seeing it. And being impacted Mm -hmm. by it, not understanding it, her bafflement. Uh, Mm -hmm. She's a she. We're going to find out. And I I think we almost always, maybe always, get violence here amplified and made more resonant through the emotional impact it has on someone. We don't... Mm -hmm. I get bored to tears in a lot of the superhero movies because there's all of this thrashing and flailing and CGI destruction But I'm not really seeing it impact, land Mm -hmm. on someone. And so I I think that that is what makes this uh, a tender horror moment. Also, Goldie's. Oh, oh, I forgot to tell everybody. So I I know people can't see it. We'll have to put it. I have, I don't know how many people have this. This is um, Goldie, the gargoyle. I have my box. Oh, my little God. Goldie. It's mint in the box, people. Uh, take a picture of it. We'll put it up sorry, in the show notes. I, I just want to say that I, I believe that that this may be worth a lot. But it's usually not in <laughs> comics. Whenever people think they have a collectible, it turns yeah. out that it's not really. I have my original Shannon the She-Devil comics, but they're in bad shape. So I don't think I could get a lot of money. But I, I, mm-hmm. I do cherish my Goldie. 
Oh, Goldie's so cute. Goldie is incredibly cute. And when you showed me that earlier, I was like, oh, does that mean she comes back? Because I just saw her in this thing and thought she was so incredibly cute. Uh, but back to your, your you know, uh, commentary about violence and the impact. I think you're absolutely right. Um, there is a lot of spectacle for spectacle's sake, you know, and a lot. And when you talk about the Marvel movies as someone who, you know, dedicated many years of her life to discussing Marvel movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, I would absolutely agree with you there. There's a lot of spectacle and it doesn't always anchor itself in human experience. And again, that's what I think in these and in the work of Neil Gaiman in general, but in specifically in these comics, I'm seeing that over and over again is that we we have spectacle. We have these amazing things that are happening that are so visually cool and interesting to experience. Um, but, you know, it's one thing to have like Rachel's father's guts all over the wall, but for his guts to be all over the wall, be infected with with anthropomorphized demons and know that he is still alive in this experience, like that is an impact to see the impact of Constantine's love for Rachel on this horrific moment. Um, that is anchoring this horror in human experience because that is the purpose of horror. And that's the purpose of all of these stories. Every story, I will argue, the purpose of it is to relate it to human experience and to give us that experience through this incredibly exaggerated experience, you know? Okay, so moving into my favorite uh, uh, page, not panel, page, because I'm learning all of the, the words now. Um, all right. So in page 58 in the Kindle version, um, I love this page where, which opens, of course, with dream in bed saying it was a dark and stormy nightmare. And then we have these like the red lines and that's the gutters, correct? Between all the panels, the little red lines there of space that like separate mm -hmm. them out. Um, and we see dream and God, I love this image of dream. And there's just the clouds and darkness behind him. And then the lashing of the rain sideways um and he's talking about before my imprisonment i knew the journey would have meant nothing to me it would have i would not have needed to travel and we see the close-up of his face and the rain splattering down on him he is weakened he is exhausted and then another slash panel and these are all with curvy lines they all kind of curve into each other as they move through the experience of him traveling through storm and being so weak until finally he lands back in the bed and we see him and he's just i remember the wind on my face staring down at the dreamscape below me and then I was here. And that's when we move into the existence, the experience of Cain and Abel's place. Um, but I absolutely love the, the shapes of the panels, the movement, how we have the slashing rain that is going from panel to panel and kind of drawing your eye through this movement in time. Um, it's really just so beautifully done. I absolutely love that page. It's a wonderful page. And in this issue in general, I feel mm -hmm. like there's such wonderful use of, of blacks, meaning the mm -hmm. way it is inked, there is just a lot of shadow. Yeah. And it, it, things are defined by these shadows, these deep, uh, just, just if you step back from any of these pages, there's just mm -hmm. so much ink and darkness in them, yeah. which is, it's beautifully done. Um, and at the same time, you know, at times there's this nice cartoony lightness, which it gives you that blend with with yeah. the horror. I, the the use of slanted panels here, you, you're getting this feeling of flow and motion. Mm -hmm. And yet it's also just as in filmmaking, when you turn something off that that straight vertical axis mm -hmm. and you slant it, you get a feeling of slight disorientation. Yep. Maybe something is a little dreamlike. Maybe the the character that you're following is having a, a disoriented state as well. And, and mm -hmm. in this case, both of those things are true. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. I like it a lot. Um, all right. So, Lisa, what's your favorite part of these two? Uh, the, my favorite part, I, God, I love Cain and Abel. Uh, mm -hmm. I love the three witches. Uh, but in the end, I think the range of emotions that Constantine shows here, it just it kind of makes him a perfect Kirk 
to to dream <laughs> Spock. And right. he's a tough bastard, but he's human and living demon flesh walls creep him out. I, I like oh, God that. bless him. <laughs> bless his heart. Um, I got to say my favorite moment is when dream is kind to Rachel at the end. When, when we bring in this inhuman experience that that touch of humanity, I think it is it's just such a beautiful moment. And it's a beautiful moment of characterization for dream. And especially with this added context that you brought into it, it makes that even more interesting and nuanced, you know, about is it kindness, is it power, is it a combination of the two? It's a complex character. I love that. If you enjoyed this conversation and would like to join in, connect with the show on Twitter, follow at Chipperish and use the hashtag EndlessPodcast, or send your comments or questions to Endless at Chipperish.com. We would love, by the way, I, as a former assistant editor, I want questions. Oh, yeah. Send in questions. She will answer them for you. That's what she does. It's awesome. This episode of Endless was brought to you by the Chipperish Media Producers who support us on Patreon at the power producer level. These people are the reason why Endless is coming to you free and ad free right now. So thank you to Abby, Alice, Christina, Erica, Jonathan, Kevin, Kristen, Rose, Sarah, Shelly, Stephania, and... Stephanie. And this week's special message for our power producers. I hope that you don't expect me to go on public transport with you dressed like that. <laughs> to find out how you too can support Chipperish Media, visit patreon.com slash chipperish. Other ways to show your support. Write a great review on Apple Podcasts, tell your friends about the show, or tell yourself it's not the fall. Falling doesn't hurt. It's when you stop. We will be back next time with Volume 1, Preludes and Nocturnes, Issues 4 and 5, A Hope in Hell, and Passengers. Until then, something of mine came into your possession. I want it back. Now. Now.